The Bathory has arrived at Dumo Island. As we approach the station, a sense of apprehension grips me, gnawing at the edges of my resolve like a hungry beast. For the Admiralty, back in fallen London, has tasked me with retrieving a piece of strategic information, a task that carries with it a weight of responsibility that I cannot ignore. I and M has a fungal operation here, felling giant bulgous shrooms for building materials, harvesting Kiralee for its medicinal properties. It's a desperate little outpost, something resembling civilization. Spores drift through the air as the great shrooms tower overhead. An affable factor awaits. Oh, hello, Captain. Thank God for visitors. We'd go quite mad out here otherwise. <laughs> quite mad. How can we be of assistance? I rummaged in my pockets for the pass sign, handing it over to the affable factor. The Admiralty, of course, had tasked me with bringing back strategic information. This man was my contact. Yes, yes, I, I have it here. The courier ship to Mount Palmerston stopped off to resupply. Tell the Admiralty. Tell them I miss my children. Tell them I can't take it here any longer. The spores, the dark. The factor continued for some time, his rant not relevant to this journal. Yet now I have acquired the information the Admiralty required. With it, I should be able to acquire more favor and to boot. If a courier ship had stopped by recently to resupply, before heading to Mount Palmerston, surely the isle could not be that far. Beyond the strategic information, a port report would still be required. I record INM's activities here, which are not all that interesting. Nevertheless, I record diligently what I can. The crew seemed restless. And so I made the call for all to disembark so that we might explore the isle together. All across it, close crowded thickets of Bulgus and Skirli. The Iron and Misery Company fells them daily, but they grow back almost as fast. Then, suddenly, rat corsairs. As we walked, we entered a gully. Yes, the ambush's favorite terrain. It looked like such a short and easy way, but now a sudden flood of black and white fur confronts me. A starving torrent of Aratius Fiber Corsairs. Their chief addressed me in a piping, inhuman voice. Easy there, me giants. We're in dire need. Here, lend us help, and we'll pay well for it. No need to fight. I can't help but notice his rat hand is on the hilt of his rat cutlass. There were but two options. Give them what they want, or refuse the trade. Rat bites fester. There was a high chance of losing good men and women. And so, reluctantly, I spoke of trade. They're only rats, but they are a lot of rats, and they have what looks like a rattling gun. This isn't a straight robbery. They're willing to exchange drowning pearls for the supplies to repair and restock. Yeah, not bad for a door filler. Not bad at all. A pleasure doing business. Should you ever find yourself beneath the floorboards of Khan's glory? Look me up, calm seas. The Corsair passed over five drowning pearls still chilly from the fingers of drownies. However, in the process, we lost three supplies, leaving us with a single box, a trade I was not so eager to make with only one echo to our name. The provisioners here were sluggish and hostile to boot, selling supplies for 30 echoes a pop. We would be in danger should we not find more soon. And so, yet another difficult decision needed to be made. The choice to gather supplies. Some of the island's fungus is good to eat, some of it poisonous, hallucinogenic, or mischievous. 
Our luck could go either way. As we searched, the spores lay thick on our face. They coat our tongues. One of the crewmen began to whimper. Oh, Christ, he said. They've reached my heart. I think I'll be harvested yet. Harvested yet? The other crewman dragged him back to the ship before he calmed down again. No surprise, only terror. Pulling out the map, we were not far from fallen London. While I wished to continue our search from Mount Palmerston, doing so with so little supply was a foul plan indeed. I did have in my possession some recent news. Should we become desperate, I could choose to head to the sisters first. No doubt they would offer us something, yet I feared all of this had been a waste of fuel. The drowning pearls themselves could not even be sold on the London market, and every time we returned, that unstamped box of brilliant souls could get us caught by the authority. Regardless, it was a risk we were going to have to take. I set us on a course for London, traveling as fast as the battery could carry us. And then, trouble on the horizon, a pirate. Perhaps we had a chance yet. Opening fire, the first volley put a hole in the side of the ship. The second, finding its mark, circling around them. A final shot brought them to the depths. And then, a chance to scuttle, finding a cache of curiosities and another bolt of fabric, spider silk. A fabric that would still fetch us a fair price in London. I knew better than to look a gift horse in the mouth. And then, before I knew it, the sisters were close, their aisle beckoning, our stomachs hungering for a meal as I arrived. There was no need to exchange news. The sisters were giddy, happy to welcome us. I sought out Lucy, the middle sister, once again, and we were well fed, with extra supplies, and yet another memory of a distant shore. We set forth for London, still desperately in need of supply. Ah, the wolf stack docks, and no authority waiting for us. Our luck was looking up. Our first stop, no doubt, was to the survey office, turning in our reports of Hunter's Keep, Demo Island, and the strategic information the Admiral himself required of us. I was ushered into his office once again. The Admiral sat up, and although he steepled his fingers, he pretended to be calm. It was hard to read him with those glasses, but he read the summary intently. Satisfactory, he said at last. Eminently satisfactory, actually. Good work. Take this for your trouble. The clerk will see you paid. And that pay most certainly was good. 150 echoes. Before leaving, I asked if we could acquire more information. The Admiralty's agent passed on a request for information from Mount Palmerston, somewhere to the northeast of London. We had a direction, a purpose, a path forwards. But that path would also lead me back to the alarming scholar to share word of the sister's memory. The scholar brought out the macaw of memories once again, a bird that looked far too old, its eyes covered by a grey haze. It had listened intently as I recalled the memory, and for my trouble, ten echoes, and more favor with the university. It had been a time since I rested in the blind helmsman. The room was starting to gather dust, yet I hoped to earn a restful night there. The rats kept me awake for most of the night, with their muttering and skirmishing. My mind turned to the corsairs, with their cutlasses and rat guns. The room was warm though, and the door thankfully had locked. As I awoke, my mind turned to my contact, Mr. Huffman, and the price he required for information regarding my father. He was fond of stories, and required a tale of terror, a memory of a distant shore, and a Z story. The memory was easy enough to find, yet a true Z story I was yet to earn. Saddling up to Mrs. Plenty's shipside provisioners, I purchased four more supplies. 
and then wandered to the Wolfstack Exchange, first of all selling the bolt of spider silk, then purchasing more mushroom wine, leaving 20 echoes in my pocket. Leaving London behind, we would unload our cargo in Venderbite, and then continue to the northeast, ever searching for the elusive Mount Palmerston, stopping at the keep along the way to compile a quick report and nothing more. There would be no time to luncheon with the sisters this day. Before long, the fires of Carissa's Point and the Hornman Stag was in sight. The must and dry rot of Venderbite was on the wind. Whilst wandering the city, I couldn't help but take note of the monumental ruins. The builders of this place worked with great slabs of neath wall stone, carved with blank-eyed, unsmiling faces and blocky, stoic serpents. I could search warily among the ruins, or choose instead to picnic. Creepers climb the shattered pyramid, an owl blinks from an idol's mouth. In the undergrowth, a cave lizard munches decorously on a white cricket. This place seems peaceful. I chose to rest a while. Wine and sea bread. I and my comrades found stones to perch on and munch lather bread, truffles, and herring. Someone passed around a bottle of Greyfields, an adequate vintage. White crickets buzzed in the weeds. A shiver of wind passed by. Then the air was still with that absence of chill that passes for warmth down here. Two sailors compared their tattoos, and my head swam pleasantly with the wine. I was happy. We left for the Arcade of Size, and after selling all of our casks of mushroom wine, I had 319 echoes, a profit I had not known for some time. And while the supplies were more expensive here, I chose to purchase at least one more. From here, we would travel east, once again into the unknown, to the north of the Iron and Misery Fungin Co. Out there, I hoped to find it. The elusive Mount Palmerston. But no doubt that was not the only thing we would find out here on the glassy surface of the sea. Our small blemigan brought my attention to them before the rest of the crew took note. A swarm of sea bats diving over the green mirror beneath us. They had no doubt caught our scent. I ordered the light extinguished. We trudged on as the great light of Moody sliced through. We caught sight of them closer now. Three sailors fought them off valiantly as the blasted creatures took off with a piece of the battery's deck. Yet we had escaped for now into the fog bank. And before us lay Demo Island. We were close enough that it would make sense to dock and form a report. Yet as we neared the isle, and I bit down on a chunk of grit baked in our ship's biscuit, my tooth cracked and the crew chuckled. Yet when the object turned out to be a diamond, small and badly flawed, but a diamond, nevertheless, they all hushed. Diamonds are sacred to stone, one says. Give it to the Z, Captain. It'll be luck for us. There were two options before me. Do the careful thing. Follow the sailor's words. As sailors pray to stone when they want home, hearth and healing. She's the kind of god you want on your side. But it was a diamond. And to throw such a thing into the Z just to appease some nameless god. I struggled with both. Yet the eyes of the crew were fixed on me. I was their leader. I was their captain. I would not fall to such selfish folly. And so, reluctantly, I cast it overboard. The diamond glinted once as it reached the apex of its arc. Then down, down, and a wave reached up to take it. I felt such loss. Yet the sailors smiled and cheered, offering prayers to stone. As we continued to the isle, I knew not what to think. I diligently compiled our report, and then saw the factor was still close by. And then my eyes fell upon the factor. Perhaps we could have tea. The poor fellow needs the company, and he can spare an hour away from his schedule. We sat on the veranda of the factor's house, looking out over the fungal jungle. 
an expanse of green and sour gold. The air was thick with hovering spores. The scones are stale, even the tea has a hint of mildew, but the factor is good company. He shares odd stories about the Gant Pole, where monsters swarm, about the seductions of the principles of coral, the infestations at Featherhaven. He also, he also has a load of bulgous frond, carted aboard my ship. He waved away my thanks. I've eaten so much of the stuff that I fear I might be transformed entirely into fungus. He leant confidentially towards me. It happens, you know. But one does have to eat rather a lot of it first. I felt somewhat more at ease. And like I was gaining a greater part of the whole picture. And the extra supplies would not be turned away. And so, from the isle, we set our course to the north. Through the fog bank, searching for Mount Palmerston. We left the funging station traveling to the east, our voyage leading to bonny reefs. The reef itself, made out of a mass of coral, a maze of jagged rocks and treacherous currents. Yet that was not the only danger there. As we navigated the reef, a hostile ship materialized on the horizon. Its intentions, at first veiled, were lifted as a flare illuminated the reef. With swift maneuvering and a prayer on our lips, we narrowly eluded the grasp of our pursuer. The Bathory, slicing through the waves with a grace born of desperation, turning our sights southward, we ventured into the foreboding expanse of the Phosgene Bleaks, where volcanic tubes emerged from the sea like gnarled fingers reaching for the heavens. The air crackled with an otherworldly energy, a harbinger of the dangers that lay ahead. Though the sight of the volcanic tubes hinted at the presence of Mount Palmerston, doubts lingered like shadows in the depths. No respite awaited us in these cursed waters, for as we forged ahead, another hostile vessel emerged from the mist, its armored hull glinting ominously in the false light. Flares burst into the night sky, casting an airy glow over the tumultuous seas as the deadly dance of battle began. The Bathory maneuvered with a precision born of desperation, her crew working in tandem to evade the relentless onslaught of enemy fire. Volley after volley thundered across the waves, the cacophony of cannon fire drowning out the roar of the surf. With each passing moment, the tension mounted, our fate hanging in the balance like a ship caught in the tempest's grip. Yet amid the chaos and carnage, there burned a spark of defiance, a flicker of hope that refused to be extinguished. With steely resolve, we fought tooth and nail against our adversaries. Each maneuver deftly performed, and then, in a deafening crescendo of fury and flame, victory was ours. The enemy ship, battered and broken, slipped beneath the waves. As the smoke cleared and the echoes of battle faded into the night, we stood victorious, our hearts heavy with the weight of our triumph. For in the crucible of conflict, we had emerged stronger, yet with our heads held high, we all turned in unison catching sight of something floating amid the wreckage. Not cargo, rather a person. There, amongst the debris, a legendary clay woman corsair. She clung tightly to the last few scraps of floating debris, defeated but defiant. I ordered a rope thrown overboard. I know a poet when I see one. It took three crewmen to pull the pirate poet from the sea's clutches, while others muttered about bringing an unfinished man, an unfinished woman, aboard the ship. She just smirked. She carried very little with her, but the verses of poetry, tattooed over every visible inch, and an old sword, almost as chipped as she. Fortunately, her salvaged possessions also include a jangling money purse on her belt. Fat and ready to pay the traditional freedom price of her current bounty. As much as the crew could subdue her, all are relieved once she is aboard a lifeboat, rowing away through the darkness towards Gader's Moor. I did wonder 
should I ever see them again. For now, though, we had 400 echoes for our troubles. The fight had cost us dear fuel, and the hull had been damaged. We could not linger out on the sea for long, yet I was determined to push on, if but for a day longer. As our reserves grew low, I saw them, looming out of the darkness, two great shapes. The Blemigan trilled excitedly. There, in the distance, the great salt lines waited. There was a vast sorrow in their empty eyes. Two basalt beasts, cathedral-sized, they frown eternally at each other across the black waves. The north one carries an encampment. Creeping human figures eat away at its features like rot. Pick, pick, picking. There's a supply dock below. I first knew that I would have to perform a report. Time, basalt, dissolution. I recorded the activities of the unmakers, such as they are. I write of stone and silence. Whilst performing the report, I saw the unmakers piling the rubble near the docks. It would seem they're here to reduce the salt lines to rubble, one block at a time. The blocks would earn profit back in London. I would need a deposit of 200 echoes and at least 20 units of spare cargo space, both of which I had. If the stone weeps, an unmaker advises, ignore them. Unless they flood your hold, of course. Then you should probably drop them overboard. Don't uh, tell anyone I said that. The unmakers moved 20 blocks of sphinx stone into the hold of the battery. The unmakers have smashed these sad and rubbly remnants off of the flakes of a salt line. A contact in London will supposedly purchase them. I was tempted to carry more, but before we did, it only felt right that some form of right should be performed. The face of the northern sphinx is all but gone. Lost faces are sacred to salt, they say. I am drawn there. To what end? Salt's voices, distant but clear, I found I couldn't help myself. I dove from the sphinx's face down in a clean arc towards the sea's chilly darkness. I floated there in the quiet until my lungs were bursting, until a light bloomed behind my eyes. I rose, gasping, to the prickle of the false stars above, and to the shocked faces of my crew. I had brought something back with me, an implication extraordinary as it was, a secret revealed to me by salt, something that I had yet to fully understand, but something worthy, no doubt. As much as I wished to carry more stone back with us, we had not the space, and now we were limited to just one unit of fuel and supply. We would have to be cautious. The light, for now, would remain off, and our path would take us directly west, back in the direction of London. The battery spluttered somewhat, yet the lights of London were closer now. The weight of the Sphinx Stone did indeed weigh us down, yet the thought of profit pushed us onwards. It was to be yet another gamble, returning to London before we had offloaded the souls. Yet, what were the chances the revenue men would be waiting for us? The crew celebrated as we neared the docks. Another successful voyage. There had earned many tales to tell. Even I was happy to be back so soon. Yet, that happiness vanished as the Bathory reached its boarding, and the revenue men waited for us. I looked to Harry and the heir nervously, giving them a signal, hoping that they might do something to help. The investigators tramped up and down the freshly mopped stairwells in their nasty boots. They poke and pry and prod, yet they find nothing. The crate successfully hidden, yet we may not be so lucky in the future. I first showed up to the survey office again, turning in the reports that we had gained so far. Then came the delivery of the stone. Special constables, black uniforms, distinctive caps, and the badge of the Ministry of Public Decency. Wait with a cart by the battery. Sign, sign, sign. 
His receipt is a discretion contract. He is a penalty contract. My vision is blurred by the end of it all. The cart rumbles off into the coiling fog, and I am left with five hundred echoes for my trouble. Now, with a thousand echoes, I was richer than I'd been in many years, and it would seem that we had discovered a lucrative method of earning coin. While at the docks, I approached the Admiralty Yards, intending to call in some of the favor we had earned so far to have the battery repaired for twenty-five echoes. Before long, she was ship shape. As I left the yard, intending to return to my lodging, I was approached by an irrepressible cannoneer. Captain, are you looking for a gunner? I'm looking for a ship. Here are my references. Here are more references. Here's my design for a whistling shell. Here's my colleague. He'll stay on shore. And here's my hand. Will you take it? For twenty echoes, the officer seemed like a steel. Oh, this is interesting. Room for improvement. There is always room for improvement. Wait, let me make some notes. Paper. A cannoneer disappeared onto the battery. They were cheery and enthusiastic. A welcome but unnerving trait in a gunner. Hello, uh, what can I do for you? I have lists. They spoke as I followed them into their quarters. I was interested as to what this list may outline. We spoke for a time about the lack of attention the cannons had seen. I believed that their time on the ship could very well help us when it came to surviving other hostile vessels and sending them to the bottom of the sea. Arriving at the provisioners, I knew we would be in need of both fuel and supplies going forwards. With ten fuel and seven supplies, I was set to spend the rest on mushroom wine. Twenty casks filled the hold. My mind was excited by the possibility of a trade run. From Ford and London, we would travel to Hunter's Keep, north to Vanderbite, to sell our wine, east to Demo Island, and then finally south to the Salt Lines, to fill our hold with bricks before returning to London. Yet, while that was all good and well, it was still not Mount Palmerston. And so, while it was the route I wished to travel, it would not be the route we would travel this time. Most of it would follow my desires, however. Hunter's Keep, no doubt, would be our first stop. The recent news I would trade with the sisters for a pleasant luncheon. This time, I sat with Phoebe, the youngest and most watchful of the sisters. Yet again, throughout lunch, I drift, and it would seem, this time as we set to leave, Something has changed with the sisters, something that I was unaware of as of yet. Shortly after leaving the sisters, we encountered a pirate Pinace. The vessel was far weaker than our own, and it did not take long with our new gunnery officer to render the vessel inert. As it slipped below the waves, we picked through the Pinace, shaking out a bolt of fabric, spider silk. And with that, we continued on carrying a pleasant smile until the dim lights of the tomb colonies greeted us once again. After performing the report, I sold all twenty casks of our mushroom wine, and instead of heading directly east to Dumo Island, we would instead travel to the northeast, seeking out the ever-elusive Mount Palmerston. Shortly after leaving the colonies behind, we could hear the screech of a swarm in the distance. Lights were extinguished. The crew went silent as we tried to avoid the hunger of the Z-Bats. Thankfully, this day, the bats were unable to find their prey. The battery now glided over dark water, darker than I had ever seen. We were further now from home, further into the unknown. Not a single isle was near. The ship's bat returned time and time again, silent, having seen nothing beyond the horizon. But then something else found us, a music, a music carried on the wind, and finally light. To our northeast, the chapel of lights was now within our sight. Furtive faithful gather in the shadows between the many, many candles. A bell tolls in the chapel tower, cracked iron laughter. Beware, the aisle is full of voices. 
I first set out to gather intelligence. What occurs here, between the darkness and the light? There was a smiling priest in a red cassock, tending to the chapel. The congregation are shy of light. They come and go in little ships, and it's strangely difficult to count them. Perhaps some of them are imaginary. Still, I note the name of a ship or two. There seems to be a service at the chapel. A great bell tolls, and the few ragged faithful gather for St. Arthur's lesson. To attend, one must bring offerings, and right now we had not the supplies to spare. However, at the chapel, a smiling priest unlocked the door of a storehouse. Here, he said, eat, but take nothing away with you. And so we ate, red and rich. They have shark steaks, plucked from the sea, thin slices of cavern tuna, translucent and delicate as paper, little crimson cakes flavored with cinnamon and coated with poppy seeds, tomatoes impossibly ripe and sweet so far from the surface. We gorge ourselves and leave the juices dripping from our chin. There were no supplies to gain here, yet with our bellies full, we returned to the bathory. We were soon yet to find the elusive mountain, yet still I knew it was out there, somewhere in the sea. Together, here on the Bathory, we would find it. And then, once free of our responsibility, we can set to earning echoes. A chance to improve the Bathory, or perhaps even purchase a more adequate vessel. I made sure to hide this writing from her, lest the ship see and grow jealous. The Bathory was home, and we would care for her yet. For now, we planned our next step.